There were no shots fired. Uh, there were casualties, but those were more on the espionage side. And uh, it was much more a political war than, uh, than it was an armed conflict. Um, and like I said, just recently they did recognize the Cold War as, uh, as an armed conflict. And it's actually the longest war in the history of the country. What are the dates, Steve? Uh, the 2nd of September, 1945 was the beginning of the Cold War, which did coincide with the end of World War II. Neither side could decide how they should divvy up the booty, and that's really what started the Cold War. Uh, it ended 26 December 1991, which was shortly after President Reagan, I believe, said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Tear down that wall. That was in the Cold War. This is a certificate that Congress issues to veterans of the Cold War. You know, I'm going to pass around a couple of textbooks, and these were actually used in Hudson Falls High School in the 1960s. They've since been discarded, but this is one of the textbooks you would have had as a 12th grader. The title of it, read the title for me. Democracy versus Communism. This is your whole book. This one is called The World of Communism, kind of like an expose. And of course, you see the Kremlin on the front cover. So we'll pass these books around. Here's two more books that will circulate this period, okay? They're both my copies. I have two of them. They came out in the 1980s, early 1980s. I think one of them my copy, actually. I don't think so, no. Uh, probably is. The title of it is Nuclear War, What's in it for you? It's by a group, nonpartisan group called Ground Zero, trying to get the facts out there. This came out during the height of the Cold War when I was leaving for college and he was leaving for the Navy. And it said, what's in it for you? There's an asterisk next to it. And the back says, nuclear war could happen tomorrow. The good news is you might be killed. The bad news is you might survive. And then the subheadings, it's a very cheery book. Here's about everything you want to know about nuclear war, but we're just too scared to ask. And this is something we really don't talk about much in school, but they're still out there, obviously. What's new in nuclear weapons? Uh, four simple, easy to use scenarios for killing 500 million people. Space Invaders and Star Wars, military technology in the 1980s and the Nuclear Bomb Club. It's getting less exclusive all the time. So it's got everything about the history of nuclear weapons. And let me ask this question right now. When, when was the first time in history that these type of weapons were used? Um, the bombing of Japan. What year was that? It was 1945. What was the first city? It was Hiroshima. The second one? Nagasaki three days later. Uh, how many times have nuclear weapons been used since? Zero. And one of the reasons they weren't used was because of the simple premise. MAD. Raise your hand if you can tell me what MAD stood for. It's an acronym. M-A-D. Teddy, tell them. Mutually Assured Destruction. We had enough weapons to wipe them off the earth. They had enough weapons to wipe us off. More than you use your weapons. You're not going to use your weapons, but you had to keep them armed and you had to keep them pointed, and that's what we did for years. Now, to explain a little bit further, Mr. Chitton and I call him Teddy all the time because he's my buddy. Yeah, please do, Teddy. He uh, <coughs> he was actually on a nuclear submarine, one that carried ballistic missiles. And understand how important this was, and understand how secret the program that he was involved in was during the 1980s. He served eight years in the uh, U.S. Navy. You have to understand a little bit about the history of the technology of how do you throw the bomb. Okay, we've got the bomb. The bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, I think there were about 20,000 tons of TNT. The bombs that we developed in the 50s were called H-bombs or hydrogen bombs, 50 times more powerful than single bombs that wiped out 100,000 people, you know, in the blink of an eye, essentially. 50 times more powerful. In the 50s, we developed those. In the 60s and 70s, we developed even more powerful weapons. But the other thing you have to think about is how do you get the bomb to the target? And what does the other side know about how you're going to get it there? And how was the first atomic bomb delivered? By airplane. Okay, so you had you had airplane that carry the bomb. <coughs> but out of World War II came the rocket technology, the ICBMs, 
and more importantly, probably are the SLBMs. Does anybody know what ICBM stood for? It's another acronym. Go ahead. The Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. The Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Yeah, forest. Well, it's a range. Three to five thousand miles. Three to five thousand miles. Okay. What was the intercontinental? Intercontinental ballistic missile. In other words, between continents. Is Google Earth on here? found himself quite frequently and I'll let him talk more about it in a minute but of course here's Mother Earth here's the UK again there's Scotland where he was you have to remember this is the Soviet Union and I think I remember Ted telling me recently that he didn't realize really how close his patrols were to the Soviet Union when he was in a submarine patrolling the North Atlantic up here you know where are we here we're in North America. Your ICBMs were land-based missiles. The missile silos, many of them were located in the Midwest. And of course, when they fired, they would go over the top of the world. That was the shortest route between two points. Each one of those ICBMs was equipped with nuclear warheads. In other words, one missile could carry more than one, uh, could wipe out 10 cities. Okay, it had 10 warheads on it. And it was all programmed computerized. The idea of mutually assured destruction was this. You wanted to get off a first strike, and the first strike capability was very important, so you had to do it very uh, quickly and efficiently. But you still have 30 minutes before it hits the target. And as soon as you launch, what's the other guy doing? He's launching his missiles. He knows where yours are. They're already pre-programmed to a computer. So if one of them goes off, essentially you're going to have something like this going on across the world with missile technology coming in. Okay. The next step or development, which kind of brings the submarines into play, were the SLBMs. Those were submarine launch ballistic missiles. And uh, this is what uh, Mr. Chittman was on, one of these, and he was a nuclear missile technician. Um, shall we go to the film clip now? Because you get an idea of how important this was in our nuclear arsenal. The big difference was they were undetectable. The Russians knew where the ICBMs were. They had no idea where the submarines were. And that was the key. <clears throat> the other part of the question was, do you think the Russians had SLBMs? Probably, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Dangerous. Yeah, and then, oh, darn it, I forgot it. So if something comes up that you want to ask a more in-depth question about, just jot it on the back of the paper, and then uh, we'll do our best to get those questions an answered for you guys. Can you bring a picture of... Off again. Yep. Now we're going to ask Mr. Chitna some questions. Yeah, there he is. What year is that, G? That was 1980. What are you doing in that pick? Um, the launcher operations supervisor. I was in charge of 16 nuclear weapons. Each weapon would. 10 nuclear armed warheads per weapon. That's a missile tube right there. I'm We're in the middle, middle level of the missile compartment. We used to call it Sherwood Forest because the missile tubes looked like trees. And the weapons, basically a hatch opens on the top of the submarine, you're underwater. Yes, the hatch opens on the top, there's a uh, diaphragm. Now these missiles are probably about three stories tall. They weigh 32 tons and uh, they're launched actually by steam pressure. That's how we get them off the ship. 
they actually don't ignite their first stage rocket motor until they're 150 foot above the surface of the ocean. Uh, it's, it's really amazing how they get such a big missile out of, uh, out of the submarine tubes. Uh, so how many guys would be on, on a patrol with you? Uh, 140 men on the ship, 127 enlisted, uh, 13 officers. And uh, how long would you go out to sea for on your patrols? Uh, the patrol was three and a half months. We'd have three weeks of uh, maintenance on the submarine, and then we'd go underwater and uh, we'd spend about 74 to 77 days underwater. Would you guys um, go into port during that 70? Never. I never made a port call. I was in the Navy for eight years, never, never made a port call. How many patrols did you go on? I did eight patrols. What was the name of your sub again? You started on one. I was on the USS Lafayette, which was a 616 class submarine, and then I did one patrol on that submarine, and that ship was going to the shipyards to be rebuilt, and I didn't want to go to the shipyards. I wanted to go back out to sea, so I transferred over to the USS Will Rogers, and I made seven patrols on the USS Will Rogers. And what kind of class submarine was that again? You said it was Poseidon class? Uh, it's a, the, the classes are actually more of the weapons, but it was considered a Poseidon class submarine because it carried Poseidon uh, nuclear weapons. Now the submarines are tridents, they're much bigger. We had 16 missile tubes, the tridents today have 24 missile tubes, and uh, they're just amazing. They're amazing. They're almost 600, 650 foot long and four stories tall, and it's amazing to think that you can submerge it and actually surface it. So when you go out on your patrols, I know you were up in the North Atlantic. Why were you up in the North Atlantic, for one thing? What were you doing out on patrol? What would you do? We would do circles. We would leave Scotland. We'd go through the Firth of Clyde. We'd go up to the North Atlantic. And once we got to our patrol package, we sat there for almost 11 weeks and just did circles. That's all we did. We sat there for 74 to 77 days with our weapons. Uh, from that location in the North Atlantic, we could reach every major city in Russia. And that was our, our goal, was to wipe them off the face of the earth. So you had, you said, how many nuclear weapons, you know, warheads on top of missiles did you have on the ship, on your boat? 160. 160, 160 nuclear weapons on Equals the ship. 160 Soviet cities that could be wiped out by one ship. And there were 41 ships. And there were 41 ships, our ships patrolling. Now do you have any idea, did the Russians have similar numbers and as far as their submarine uh, fleet? They, they had similar numbers of submarines. They didn't have similar numbers of weapons. And uh, the Russians were always two steps behind us. What made the U.S. submarine service so strong was our ability to remain undetected. If you know where the enemy is, you lost all element of surprise. But the U.S. submarines were very quiet. Uh, the Russian submarines were very loud. In fact, the Russians at one time developed a a torpedo that could go deeper than our submarines could go. Like we just saw, the uh, the Texas went down to 650 foot, and they didn't have a submarine that could, didn't have a torpedo that could reach them at that depth. Uh, the Russians had an Alpha class torpedo, but it was loud. It was so loud that we could hear it coming from miles away, and we could make our our maneuvers and uh, remain uh, once again undetected. You could evade it. We could evade it absolutely. What was crush depth? Tell them what crush depth was first and foremost, because submarine service is uh, not a day at the beach. Crush depth is um, when the submarine goes so low. Sea pressure is 44 pounds per square inch. Atmospheric pressure is about seven pounds per square inch. So if you're at 100 foot below the surface, the pressure of the water is tremendous. Anybody ever been to the bottom of an eight foot swimming pool? You can feel the pressure on your ears. That's at eight foot. Can you imagine 650 foot, what the pressure must be? It's tremendous. Crush depth is when the boat goes to the point where it crushes. And there's not much left. So we lost two submarines that way. We lost a, the Scorpion and the Thresher, uh, both in sea trials. It wasn't during it during war. And um, they went, they, they, they took a what they call a jam dive and they give it, they go all the way forward and they dive that ship at an angle that they hope they can recover from, and um, the Thresher and the Scorpion didn't recover. They just drove it right into the bottom of the ocean, and it reached crush, crush depth, and uh, that was it. They lost two crews. Literally imploded, killing hundreds of guys, 100 plus on each one of the vessels. 
One was in 63, I think the other one was at the end of the 1960s, and all these things were top secret. secret. I don't think they recovered the remains of uh, the thresher. No, they found scorpion remains. So they never found any remains of the thresher. Um, now, I think you used to tell me um, when you were out on patrol, a lot of the times it was kind of boring. Tell us what the days were. How many hours were in a day, for example, and what would you do in an average day kind of thing? Uh, it was very boring. That's why I didn't want to come here today, because most of what I did at the time was was very boring. Uh, we just we just sat there. And, but our days were broken up into six-hour periods, but there weren't enough men to work four six-hour periods in a day, so we had a, we set up 18-hour days where you would get up, you would work from 6 a.m. till 12 noon, and then you would be off until 12 midnight, and you would come back on and work from 12 midnight to 6, 6 a.m. Uh, so it would actually take four daily cycles to knock three days off the calendar, and believe me, we were keeping track of the days. Everybody had a date-to-go chart. Uh, it was. We would count down the days. That's really what we did. But meanwhile, we would train. We would go through drills. One of the scariest things, that could, what would be the most scary thing on a submarine? What would scare you the most? Dying. Dying the other Having a hole in the sub. Having a hole in the sub? Yeah, that'd be scary. You'd learn about that fast. Fire was the big thing. A fire on a submarine wipes out the whole crew instantly. Uh, there's not enough oxygen in the sub. Uh, so that's what we did. We trained for fire drills. Constantly, and the missile technicians, the missile compartment is in the center section of the submarine, so we were, and it's a big compartment, so we had a lot of room in there to store firefighting gear, and uh, that's what we did. We trained to fight fires constantly, uh, and other training, collision training, and uh, you know, uh, sea pressure leaks. Uh, we didn't want water in a people tank, as we would call it, but we did a lot of training. But meanwhile, um, we kept our finger literally on the trigger and we could go from I could be sleeping one minute and we could launch a nuclear weapon within 180 seconds from the time they manned battle stations missile to the actual first launch was less than three minutes so did you have to drill for that constantly constantly I was reading through some through some of my and I won't bore you with it but uh, some of my journals I kept journals of my patrols and uh, it was just constant, WSRT, Weapon System Readiness Test, BRTs, Battle Readiness Test, uh, daily, two and three a day, constantly, constant training. So it would be like out of nowhere, kind of like a fire drill, except you took it a lot more seriously. Yes, you took it very seriously. And you would simulate launching your weapons, and, uh, and you would hope that uh, it was a simulation and not the actual launch. Would you know? You wouldn't know? Would we know? We wouldn't know. We, you'd be able to sense it, I would think, I don't know. Yeah. I never went through it, uh, thank God. I think you would be able to tell if you were. You would know it if you launched them, absolutely. Why? Because the submarine would uh, be rocking. You know, you start spitting out 32-ton missiles one right after the other, and you would go alternate. There's two rows of eight missiles. You would launch the first missile on the starboard side and the last missile on the port side, and that would maintain the positive buoyancy that uh, you would need to keep a stable platform for your strategic launch. Well, you don't. Yeah, ship would be taking some slams and. Did you ever launch practice? No? Never launched. Never. We practiced, but uh, the submarine, after it came out of the shipyards, uh, did launch some dummy uh, rounds off the coast of Florida, and the target was actually off the coast of Africa. That's the range that uh, wow. these weapons have. But I wasn't on the ship when I actually did that. So, okay, tell me what your main job was as a nuclear missile technician or whatever you call it. We babysat the weapons. We babysat 16 nuclear weapons. That's all we did uh, between drills and field day. We cleaned a lot. Uh, there was a saying on the ship, sail she may, shine she must. And that was very true in the U.S. Navy. The cleanest ships in the world. I never gave it much thought until I visited an, uh, a British Navy submarine that used to be an American submarine. And it literally almost brought tears to my eyes to see how the Brits treated uh, their weapons compared to how the Americans treated theirs. Uh, ours were spotless. You look at the pictures that Matt showed or that Mr. Roselle showed, and you'll see they were the ships were spotless. And, uh, that was very important, fun cleaning the ship. But as far as a nuclear missile technician, um, we would we would have to make the weapons ready for a nuclear launch. Now, Scotland wouldn't let us into their waters if we had 16 uh, <coughs> nuclear missiles 
on the submarine. So we would have to unarm the weapons before we would pull into port, and that would li literally mean climbing into the weapons and taking out the guidance assembly and the electronics assembly. And those were pretty much the brains of the missile. Without a guidance assembly, without an electronics assembly, uh, the missile was actually inert and uh, it couldn't be fired. And that was part of the political process of the Cold War that allowed us to use this most beautiful body of water in Scotland. It reminded me very much of Lake George. If I took you to Holy Lock, Scotland, you would think you were in Lake George. It was uh, uh, remarkably uh, uh, similar. And uh, right in this beautiful body of water was a whole fleet of nuclear submarines. Just really almost surreal. What are we looking at here? Uh, Those are warheads. Those are nuclear tip warheads. Uh, the Poseidon submarines had. Uh, had four different configurations, but if you're going to load a weapon, you're going to load it with as many as possible. We put ten warheads on each missile. Uh, that white base that it's sitting on is called MERV. That is a, a multiple independent re-entry vehicle where MERV, once you reach outer space with these, these weapons would drop from outer space. They didn't just drop from an airplane. The, the missile would reach uh, space and MERV would coordinate, get to its target, turn, drop a <coughs> warhead, continue on to the next Russian city, turn, drop a warhead, on to Stal Leningrad and Stalin. And, uh, there you go, there's a the missile compartment right in the center. Where? Right, right here? Yep, that was called Sherwood Forest. Now that's Trident Sherwood somewhere. Forest, they call And there's, got, there, there's 24 weapons These on the tubes. Those are the missile tubes. Now those are, to put it in perspective, I'm six foot tall and I can lay down inside the missile tube. I can lay down this way. Completely sideways. Did you ever see that happen there? Oh yeah, they got pictures of me sleeping in there, waiting for a part or something like that. And there's two two uh, two warheads going off. Two, two missiles, missiles going, going off. off. Each one with ten warheads or so. Off the coast of Scotland, heading towards the Soviet city, where I was visiting. What's this at guy the time doing? he was in Russia, because of my military clearance, I wasn't allowed to go to Russia. What's he doing, Ted? Oh, looking through the periscope. I'm going backwards along the floor. See, those are civilians right there. Those are Navy guys. What, how do you feel about civilians coming on board? Oh, it stink. It was terrible. Because for the 10 days before the civilians came aboard, guess what we were doing? We were cleaning that ship. Every square inch uh, was, was spotless constantly. You know the old saying, you can eat off the floors? Well, I don't think we did, but you literally could. The bilges, you know what a bilge is? It's the lower part of the ship where the water and the nasty uh, oil and all that stuff accumulates. Not in the U.S. Navy. That bilge was as spotless as the rest of the ship. What's but, this guy with the headset probably doing? That's the helmsman and the planesman. Those guys are actually driving the submarine. It's the lowest job on the ship, believe it or not. Why? Sit there for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> driving the sub? Driving the sub, yeah. Now, did your sub have torpedoes on it? Yeah, we had the Mark 48 torpedoes, which I was surprised that the Texas, now this, we're talking 25 years right. ago, they're using the exact same torpedo. Oh, they're the same ones? Yep, the same torpedo. That's torpedo tube stuff there. Torpedo tube stuff. Torpedoes? Torpedoes, yeah, that's a torpedo room. Now, this, this ship that they're showing right here uh, is, is a an SSN. It doesn't have ballistic nuclear weapons on it. Okay, so it was an attack vessel? It was an attack vessel, yeah. But it had missile tubes on it. It had uh, uh, short range. It didn't have uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles on ballistic. it. It didn't have. What about the sonar man? What did he do? The guy who would listen. He, he, would, uh, he would listen. Every ship has a signature. And these sonar attacks would train on the signatures of all the Russian submarines. And each one, like a fingerprint, every one would be different. And these guys, they had it pretty rough too, because they'd have to sit there for six hours with their headphones on, listening for contacts, and then once they found a contact, they would have to use their training to actually determine the name of that submarine just from the sound of it. So you actually knew the names of the Russian subs? The sonar types did, yes. And they probably knew the names of the Will Rogers and our subs? They did, because they couldn't hear us. We never got close enough for them to find us. Did you ever have contact with any Russian subs under the water? I mean, as far Physical as... contact? No. We played cat and mouse games uh, constantly off the coast of Russia. They would try to find us. 
and that's why we were kept doing circles. We'd have to stay in our patrol area, but we had to stay one step ahead of the Russian fast attack submarines. Did you ever have any close calls underwater with those? No, we got lost in a British minefield once. We had to call in the British mines. We put leftover mines from World War II. And, uh, but that wasn't while we were alert. We were out on sea trials. And uh, we got home. So they got you out of that fix? Yep. OK, you see this picture? This is what Ted was talking about. That's your missile, the trajectory of the missile, the MERV or multiple, what is it? Multiple independent re-entry vehicle. Up here. Up here just a, between five and six. That's what, that, Right here? Yep. And these are what? Those are the warheads. The individual warheads. And there's the result, the mushroom. The mushroom clouds. What are we looking at? Uh, silos on this? Yeah, that's a 24, that's a, right down the center of the two rows of missiles. Looks like it's lower level. That's the access hatches you would go through. Like I said, we had to go into each missile, take out the electronics assembly, take out the gimbal assembly, and uh, that would secure the doors. Vent the tube before you unlock the door. Uh, exactly. If there's any residual gases in the tube <coughs> and you open that door, you just killed all the missile attacks. You just killed all the missile attacks? Why? Because you had. Uh, Will it blow them no, up? Just gases. It's just gas? It's just gas. Jeez. A lot of things to be careful of on a submarine. Yep, yeah, constantly. Here's the sequence underwater photography. I remember you telling me once they come out of the water so fast they wouldn't have time to get wet. They wouldn't get wet. And that right there is first stage rocket ignition. And that takes place when it senses either 150 foot above the surface or 3 G's of acceleration decreasing because it comes out of there at greater than 3 G's. Once it slows down to 3 G's, that rocket motor first stage lights off. No stopping it. No stopping it. What were you armed with? I was armed with a nightstick. Protected 160 nuclear weapons with a piece of wood about 22 inches long. Now they have, uh, we didn't have any small arms on them. On the submarine. No arms at all? We had arms, but they were locked up. We didn't have guys patrolling with weapons. Obviously, they do know. Did you do this? Did that a lot. Pinochle, backgammon. Some Spades. guys made a lot of money. Some guys made a lot of money. Some guys pulled into port and won three months' pay to the guy that made all the money. How was the food, Ted? Food was great. Food was great. Best, best fed uh, branch in the military, in all the military, was the submarines, and that was the, that was the only reason a submarine would have to surface. Believe it or not, was based on how much food you could carry. If we had unlimited capability, if if, we, if the sailors didn't have to eat, a submarine could stay underwater for ten years. But because there's only so much room, you can only carry so much food, you had to surface every three months and resupply the ship. And the submarines are also the only uh, ships in the U.S. Navy that actually have two complete crews. We had a blue crew and a gold crew. And the blue crew would spend three months underwater and we'd surface, and the gold crew would be there waiting for us, and they would take over the ship, and we would fly back to Connecticut, uh, to the New London submarine base, and we would spend two months training, and then we would fly back to Scotland and do it all over again. Each cycle is called a patrol cycle. Patrol cycle. So the submarines could actually make close to four patrols per year. They were constantly at sea. Okay. Now that you've heard Mr. Chittenden, do you have any questions to go along with? our Cold War discussion. What it was like to be on a nuclear submarine during the Cold War? Yes. Did you ever feel like you were never you weren't gonna live another day because it's like something went wrong? No, not really. They are they are so safe. And one thing that's interesting about submarine crews is that although I was a missile technician, I needed to learn how to operate every system on the ship 
from the ice cream machine in the galley, which I was very good at, <laughs> to the nuclear reactor. And, and every sailor on a submarine has to learn every aspect of every operational system. There's only 140 guys on the boat. And if one guy goes down, you need to pick up. If, uh, if all of the nukes got killed uh, in an accident, somebody would have to man that nuclear reactor. And uh, when you demonstrate an operating knowledge of every system in the ship, which is pretty grueling, uh, you would become qualified in submarines and you would receive your dolphins. And uh, that's uh, uh, something that all submariners are very proud of. If you didn't get your dolphins, they would kick you off the sub. You were not allowed to go to sea without your dolphins. Show me your dolphins. And it's hard to decipher what they actually look like. They're kind of ugly. These right here are my dolphins. And this right here is a patrol pin. And after you make your first patrol, you get a pin. And then every patrol you make after that, you get a silver pin. And after you make five patrols, you get a gold pin. So this shows that I've made five, six, seven patrols. The eighth patrol I made, I actually got off halfway through the patrol. and. Um, I fought them on it, but they didn't give me a patrol. Why, why did you get off halfway? Um, Were you done? No, I wasn't done. I wasn't done, but uh, they had to take on some civilians, and they had to make room for the civilians, so they let a few of us select uh, sailors off in New London. And I had just recently got married, so I chose to get off and spend some time with my wife. How old were you when you first joined the Navy? I, was, I had just turned 17 when I joined the Navy. And it was between my junior and senior year of high school. And I realized in my junior year that I had enough credits to graduate after my junior year, except for one damn English credit. So I had to come back for my senior year, but I took two English classes the first half of my senior year, and I was able to graduate in January. And um, I, was, I sat in this building January 31st, 1979. I was in homeroom. February 1st, 1979, I woke up in boot camp. My mom picked me up at school and took me right to the airport. So the day I graduated high school, I actually started boot camp that same day. Where was boot camp? Uh, Orlando, Florida, which was a nice place to be in February and March of 1979. Are any students in here considering enlisting in one of the branches of the armed service? Like show of hands? Navy people. How about, uh, anybody have family members who are veterans? Cool. Any Navy? Raise your keep your hand up as Navy. Where are they stationed? Where's your station? Yeah. Oh, uh, she's not stationed. My mom was in the Navy and my aunt was in the Air Force. Oh, no kidding. They're, they're, are they still in the Navy? Oh, I have that bad words, but no. They're, they're both. They're both on. Retired. Retired. Or whatever. Oh, they're retired? Really? Retired. <laughs> <laughs> and how do they uh, test your fitness to be a submarine tech? Because I can imagine the psychological impact. Psychologically, yeah. Physically, thank God. Uh, didn't have to worry too much about that. Uh, in fact, I was on the Fat Boy program most of the, my whole investment. Uh, food was good, though. Food was good. They, they, it was, didn't make a lot of sense. They fed you all you can eat, excellent food, and then they stuck you on the Fat Boy program. <laughs> didn't make a lot of sense, but, uh, Tell them why you're the most popular guy on the boat. At one point in time. This is the ice cream. I was, we had a soft serve ice cream machine and for three and a half months we had vanilla, we had chocolate. Well for one week everybody on board has to work on the mess decks for a week. And the week I went aboard, and I'm a, I love ice cream, I decided every day I worked in the mess decks for seven straight days there was going to be a different flavor of ice cream. So I used all of my military training and I came up with cherry Kool-Aid with maraschino cherries cherry ice cream, maple walnuts, uh, chocolate chip. In fact, I even got a, uh, a congratulation from the captain. He told me, uh, GFI, good ice cream. <laughs> About the only time the captain ever talked to me, actually, which was a good thing. You didn't want to, you didn't want to have to talk to the captain. Oh, okay. Tell them about some of the fun you had on the sub when uh, somebody was trying to qualify for driving the boat. Remember you were telling me a story about how you'd be very quiet and sneak around the ship? We would have trim parties. 
trim party. And, and trim is the trim of a ship, just like the trim of an airplane. You want to keep the ship uh, heading in the right direction. Well, the guy that was up in the control room that was in charge of moving water, that's how you ma maintained or achieved buoyancy, positive or negative, is by transferring water. If you want the ship to sink, you would bring in water. You would blow air out of the tanks, suck in water, it would make the ship heavier, and it would sink. Now, if you want to surface the ship, you would do the exact opposite. You would blow air into the tanks, force the water out. The guy that was in charge of moving water around was called the chief of the watch. And whenever we had a new chief of the watch qualify, of course, he's in there in control with all the officers expecting this ship to be perfectly level and trim at all times. And um, to mess with the chief of the watch, we would get 40 or 50 guys together at 200 pounds apiece. So you're talking 8,000 pounds. We'd all take our shoes off, and we would sneak around the ship. We would all go back to the engine room. Now, we just put 4,000 pounds back in the engine room. What's going to happen to the ship? Going to start taking up back, right? So the chief of the watch up there, now he's sweating bullets. Oh, my God. He starts moving 4,000 pounds of water forward to compensate for the 4,000 pounds of people in the after section of the ship. But he doesn't know they're there. He doesn't know they're there because we took our shoes off. He, he can't, can't hear them. So now he's got 4,000 pounds. Oh, boy. Got the boat ready. Captain's looking at him. This guy's sweating bullets. As soon as we hear the water going forward, what do we do? We go forward. Now what's he got? 8,000 pounds going forward. Now that boat is seriously going down. This guy is really sweating bullets now. The captain is ready to wring his neck. And uh, we would do that half a dozen times. Of course, the captain knew what was going on. Chief of the watch had no clue what was going on. It was always a lot of fun trying to wreck us up. Uh, speaking of, career. Uh, I read something that the Russians did this maneuver called a crazy Ivan. Crazy Ivan? Yeah. I believe a crazy Ivan is uh, when a torpedo comes back on its mothership. And they would have to do this dance with the submarine to try to evade their own torpedo. So they were practicing how to evade a how torpedo to, how by crazy. shooting one of themselves? Well, they wouldn't actually do it on purpose, but <laughs> it has happened. Torpedoes have come back on their own side. It hasn't happened to the Americans. You blow air out. Hey, you no longer have that air. So when you blow water, how do you get air in? Uh, we would make our own air. We made everything. We made our own water. We made our own oxygen. Um, and it would all come from the sea. H2O, right? Separate the H from the O. Now we got oxygen. But you would think, right, that eventually you'd run out of, I'd run out of air around the submarine. There's actually two super, there's a superstructure and then there's a hull. And between the hull and the superstructure, they have these big, they look like bananas, the big air tubes. And they're, they're called emergency air tanks. And that's where the air would come from. Were there any collisions? We almost collided with a sailboat once, but no. <laughs> cut right in front of us. So you could be so close to a sailboat, they don't know you're there? Like they could be no, that was that was actually pulling out of port, and they knew we were there, and they thought it'd be cool to ride the sailboat, and, you know, cut in front of the nuclear submarine. Which not, too not really right, that, but that was a scary sound. Every every different uh, every different situation would have a different alarm. If there was a fire, you would hear the fire alarm. But one of the scariest ones was the collision alarm. You didn't want to hear the collision, especially at four hundred feet. Especially with nuclear weapons now. Especially with nuclear weapons now. What other questions do we have? Go ahead. Um, do you know how, how sensitive the actual warheads were? Like, how sensitive they were? Yeah. You mean, could you go up and hit it with a hammer and make it go off? Yeah. No, they were what they called, uh, um, they, were, they were safe. It, it actually took three specific electronic signals AC arm, DC arm, and fire to actually <coughs> launch the weapon. Um, they're one of the safest weapons on the planet, actually. It takes so much to get one. And the way a, a, a nuclear warhead is actually ignited is the warhead itself is completely encapsulated in heavy explosive, HE. And they would light the HE, and it would create enough energy to start 
the fission process, and they called it the PP chain. And uh, once the fission fusion process got started, uh, that's what creates the big mushroom cloud and all the energy. Tremendous amount of energy. Could you explain to the kids what that white thing is on the top of the warhead? I have no idea. I don't know what that is. Uh, this is actually in a testing facility. That's not on the submarine. Uh, the only time we would see the warheads is every time the submarine pulled in, we would take two missiles off and put two missiles on. And as missile technicians, of course, we were the ones that did the job. And to load the missile on board, you would have to take the nose cap off. And believe it or not, the nose cap of these missiles is made out of plywood. Nine ply Sitka spruce plywood. Very lightweight. And um, the last thing we would do is we would count the configuration of the weapons, the weapons officer would verify the configuration, and we'd pat him each on the head, and we'd put the nose cap on, and we'd write to Moscow on it, and uh, then we'd put the big diaphragm closure over top of the missile, and close the hatch. This is my Soviet flag. Some of my students have seen it, but I don't know if anybody else has. <laughs> Where's the hammer in the second? Uh, this is the flag I loaned to Ted, 1986, because he wanted to bring it down to New London, Connecticut, and show it to his fellow sub sailors. This is the exact flag, Ted. And I don't want to know what you did with it down there. But he was a little ticked off at me when I went to the USSR, probably because I couldn't bring it with me. Didn't have the clearance. I had no interest in going there. And he had no interest in going to Russia. Better dead than red. That's the Cold War right there. Better dead than red. Reinvented. Of course, where's the Soviet Union today, kids? Nowhere. The Soviet Union is kaput. That's a German word for gone, done. Soviet Union. Do you know how the dates of the Cold War? December 26, 1991 was the day that Russia seceded from the USSR and it was the last of the 15 Soviet republics that actually left. And Gorbachev closed the book and the Cold War was won by my friend Ted and President Reagan. President Reagan, he was a man. He was a great president. He was my commander in chief. He was my commander in chief. <laughs> Do you have any other questions for Mr. Chittenden? Our cold warrior. Messino, do you have anything? Well, let's have a hand for Ted. Times are out. What ones did you like better? Um, I like the Will Rogers. My, I had friends aboard the Will Rogers. Uh, the gentleman who became my brother-in-law was aboard the Will Rogers. He and I, and actually at one time on the Will Rogers, there were four Hudson Falls graduates on that ship at the same time, which is pretty amazing. Yes. I, was Good luck, Mrs. Herrick. I thought she was an ISS today. Thank you. <laughs> Kaylee? <laughs> which ship was it? The first one or the second one that had the ice cream? The second one. The second one. Yeah. I don't remember much about my first patrol on the Lafayette, and that's because I was busy qualifying. Now, it usually takes two patrols okay. to get qualified in submarines, but I knew I was getting transferred off the Lafayette after my first patrol, so I figured I can either just qualify and not get my dolphins, or I can really put my nose to the grindstone, qualify in one patrol, get my dolphins, and then go to the Will Rogers as a qualified submariner. And that's exactly what I did, and it was pretty arduous. However, after I got my dolphins, the Lafayette was a 616 class, the Will Rogers was a 640 class, completely different type of submarine. So even though I qualified in the morning and got my dolphins that afternoon, an hour later, I was given a whole new ball card. I had to start all over again. So that kind of sucked. How much free time do you actually have? Um, we, we would have, we would work six hours, we would have 12 hours off. Then we would work six hours, 12 hours off. However, those 12 hours, you had to qualify, you had to train. We used to do the training for the sake of training, we called it. Constant training, um, constant fire drills. 
You know, there were times if the schedule worked out right, if you worked, uh, you know, the midnight to six shift, and then you had training and schedules, drills, and field day from six till till uh, from noon till six p.m. You had to come back on watch at six p.m. and work till midnight, and then you'd get a few hours in the rack, and they'd wake you up with drills. So it was kind of good because if you're underwater for seventy-seven days, you want the time to go by fast. And they kept us so busy that um, the time went by pretty quickly. Time goes by. Go ahead, Jay. Did you? kind of lose concept of time? When you were the only way we could tell if it was 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., anybody know? The clock. Well, the clock was 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. <laughs> Smell. Bacon and eggs. 6 a.m. It's the only way you could tell. <laughs> Any other questions for my friend Ted? Beth? <laughs> Pardon me? How often did you guys surface? Uh, once we went alert, once we went below the surface, we never surfaced. We never surfaced. Uh, the whole, the, the, the benefit of the submarine launch ballistic missiles was uh, our goal was a mobile platform for first strike. And the only way we could have first strike is if we stayed underwater. Once we went alert, we stayed alert. and. Uh, once our weapons were, were armed and ready to fire, we never surfaced. So we would go for 10 weeks without surfacing. <laughs> okay. There's nothing to see anyways. We're up in the north of Atlanta. Not much up here. You know, at this time, before we bid goodbye to Mr. Chittenden, um, I'd like to take this moment just to remind you what's going on this weekend. We have, obviously, Memorial Day's coming up. There's a... Uh, um, there's a radio program that's actually going to be broadcast nationwide. It's an interview with one of our Holocaust survivors and our liberator, Carol Walsh. And if you were here um, Friday morning, you heard Fred Spiegel speak. He talked very highly of Carol Walsh, who was one of the liberators that he got to meet when he came to our high school. The radio program is going to be broadcast um, on the story.org. The story this is the email that I sent to uh, the staff so that they're aware of it. We're telling you too, if you want to tune in, I got this email right down here from my survivor, Steve Berry. He lives in Florida and he writes, Hi, y'all. My interview with Dick Gordon about my liberation, because he was 20 when he was liberated, combined with one of my liberators, Judge Kara Walsh, will be broadcast on NPR, National Public Radio, on Memorial Day at 8 p.m. It can be heard on the internet at noontime. So if you go to this link, the story.org, on Memorial Day, after 12 noon, it should be right here. Um, this is a national radio program, and it'll be the lead story. It'll be right here. So you click on it, and you can listen to it. But I guess it's going to be prime time. It depends on where you are in the country. There aren't a lot of stations around here who actually carry that particular broadcast, but you can listen to it on the internet if you want. Okay? I have one more PowerPoint I'd like to show you. Can you bring it up for me, Sam? Yeah. There's an app with the audio, like the start music on Windows Media Player, so it's not the timing to be off. Okay. Uh, you can do it. Well, not on the it's uh, Yes? Yeah. You have to send me an email. Tara, go to your share folder. Wait, just go to the high school folder. Go to share and I'll take it. Yeah, sure.